je ne suis pas francophone, et comme vous savez, c'est une ville internationale et européenne. Je parlerai en anglais, j'espère que ça va. Euh, J'essaierai de parler lentement. Mais, mais je comprends s'il y avait les questions après, je, je, je comprends mon français très bien. Mais quand même, parler de test, de dieselgate, euh, ce n'est pas vraiment mon, mon niveau de français. Um, hello, um, so I work for Transport and Environment, uh, which is a green lobby group. So we are not academics, uh, we, we're not politicians, but we're people who are trying to push politicians to clean up our air, to get down the emissions and, and really sort out all of the problems that so far transport especially has brought to our cities and, and to Europe uh, generally. So I think you had a really good lots and lots of really good academic information really about the situation around pollutants, around norms and, and around research around them. What I would like really to talk about is the situation in Europe, Belgium as well and Brussels today, in particular the diesel problem. And why is it that despite having standards for over 20 years, we still have as dirty diesels on our roads as they were 20 years ago? So this here is taken from a report just two weeks ago by the European Environmental Agency uh, and it is looking at particles. So this is particles, not the big problem, not a problem in Brussels. You see Belgium generally is, is, is green, it's a problem in, in Eastern Europe, it's a problem in Northern Italy, but when it comes to diesel cars, old diesel is still the problem because they don't have particle filters, any diesel car produced before 2011 is full of particles and that's why emission zones in Antwerp, in Brussels are necessary for these old vehicles even though there are not many of them. Particles in transport also come from tires and from brakes so that's a coming problem. We've solved the échappement, the exhaust problem, but the next one is the non-exhaust. It's all of the things outside of the car that also create, uh, create pollution. Now, the main area I will concentrate, and uh, I think it was clear from before, will be nitrogen dioxide, so NO2. NO2 is the problem, and actually it's as bad in Brussels as it is in London and as it is in Paris, even though you can't compare the amount of cars. It is really bad in Brussels. Um, you can see that actually, quite clear on this picture, every city in Europe has an <coughs> NO2 problem. What do all cities in Europe have in common? lots of diesel cars and that is the main source of NO2 pollution. Now there are other sources for NO2, absolutely, heating, industry, you name it. But there is a big difference between a chimney up in the air or a big factory outside of Brussels. By the time it comes to your nose, it's really not as concentrated and diesel cars. When you cross Rouvillard, Rue de la Loire, whatever it is, the diesel is in your nose. And it's that concentration of diesel. Imagine children, it's exactly at their level why it is so dangerous and why it is connected today to uh, 75,000 premature deaths each year across Europe. Now, premature deaths, of course, it doesn't just you see a diesel car and you die. It's calculated in the amount of you usually die earlier because you're exposed to NO2 than you normally would have if you just lived a healthy life in the countryside. So, of course, it's, it's not a direct killing, uh, but it's really important. There's also studies that put amount of deaths exactly because of diesel manufacturers cheating in Europe. Even that has now been calculated. Its uh, numbers uh, differ, but at least 5,000 people die prematurely just because European car industry, global diesel car industry, did not respect the standards. Even one death is, is too many already. Um, so why is it that we had standards for such a long time and they don't work? If anyone ever tells you that we in Europe put climate change before air pollution, don't trust them. This is simply not true. We had air pollution standards long before climate change targets. They started in the 90s. So I, here we start with Euro 3, that's where we have evidence. But the first Euro norm came into effect in 1991. We always knew there's air pollution coming from diesel cars, all cars, petrol as well, it's, it's not saint either. But what you can see is, over the years, the standards on paper, and this is the light grey, 
have decreased. If you look from 2000 to 2016, 17, where we are today, six to eight times, so 700%. If you look at what happened on the road, this simply has not been happening. On the road, emissions continued to be high. Manufacturers did not implement, they did not meet the standards. And actually, there hasn't been that much difference, only about 60% in the last 20 years. This is not enough given the technology that we have. We have really clean diesel cars driving in the United States, for example. There's less of them, they're more expensive. But clean diesel exists. It's just not in Europe, and it's also very expensive. You might as well buy electric tomorrow if you had to buy a really clean diesel BMW today. Um, so, of course, it's important to say that after the diesel scandal, the politicians across Europe did take action. And that's why you can see the 2019 and 2021, the last ones. We will have new tests in, in Europe. The tests will be done on the road, and there will be many, many more controls on car manufacturers. So, if they will go down, not as much as they should do, because lots of flexibility have been given to car manufacturers, but eventually, if you really, really, really want to buy a new diesel car, at least wait until 2019, because they will be cleaner then. So that's really uh, the, the, the picture overall. The standards that we have have not worked, because the manufacturers did not respect them. And I'll come more detail why and, and how. Um, now, again, um, not just between the norms, but between car makers, there is a huge difference. This is based on hundreds and hundreds of tests done on the road following the Dieselgate scandal. And these are new cars, so Euro 6 is the latest norm. It's the car me and you would go and buy tomorrow and bought yesterday. And we see on average, this is average figures, the ranking of manufacturers. What is really interesting, and you can see, actually, the Volkswagen Group today, pr today produces some of the cleanest diesel cars in Europe, actually, despite the fact that they were found cheating in the United States. The problem is that many other European car makers are much worse, but they don't sell in America, and they were never found guilty in Europe, despite all the evidence, because of all of the system that is so enshrined into defending our car industry that we simply cannot really go and get them to, to account. Really interestingly, well, not interestingly now, but uh, some of the worst cars are actually the usual quite fuel-efficient small cars that we know. Fiat, uh, um, Renault, Nissan, Opel, Hyundai, so a lot of cars people buy that are not really that expensive. When it comes to NO2 pollution, are the worst, because they have a really small engine, there is no enough space on the car to put all of the cleaning technology around it, so as a result, the small engine might be good for your efficiency, for your fuel, but it emits a lot of NO2. It's just not meant to be driven. Small diesel car is a European invention. It doesn't exist anywhere else. You get truck, you get a big diesel car, yes, you need a diesel engine. Small city car, either petrol, hybrid or electric. It's the European invention and it should not be there and that's why we have our NO2 problem. This is also why a lot of the new measures put in cities today, again Antwerp and Brussels are good examples, will not be as effective to bring down NO2. Because if you simply exempt all of the new diesel cars, all of the new Euro 6, that's what you get. You cannot have a blank exemption. You have to base it on real emissions. Because Euro 6 actually means nothing. 5% of these cars meet the standards. They're as good as in the US or as petrol cars. 80% don't meet standards. And 20% of these cars are worse than cars produced 10 years ago. And this is a problem. And as such, it will make the policy to simply exempt new diesel cars ineffective. Now, why is it that they produce so much emission? How is it possible to produce 1,400 times more pollution than a European norm? It's incredible. Well, the answer we have now, we didn't for a long time, but the diesel gate opened the eyes of many as to why. The, in simple terms, car manufacturers have found a loophole in legislation and they just switch off emission control completely. 
our rules are exactly the same as in America. And they're the same for its, its, its physics, its chemistry, its engineering. In certain conditions, emission control cannot work because it's not safe for the engine. In the United States, for example, if it's really cold, if it's minus three outside, you can switch off EGR, one of the technologies, because it's dangerous. In Europe, it has been taken to such an extreme, and no one has been watching or implementing the law, and I'll come to it later as well, that a lot of manufacturers, especially Opel and Renault, completely switch off their controls at 17 degrees Celsius. Basically, most of the time in Brussels, if you see a Renault car, it's just as dirty as a diesel car 15 years ago. The emission control is off, because they claim they need it to protect the engine. Now, I would say, what's wrong with the engines that they can't work at 70 degrees Celsius? Imagine that argument for, uh, for safety, uh, seat belts. Sorry, seat belt doesn't work too cold outside. It would never work. This, this, um, there's other cases, so this is the most knowing one, what is called a thermal window, is when manufacturers switch it off of the temperature. Because in the European test, the test is at 23, 25 degrees Celsius. So they're checked at a high temperature. When they're on the road, in low temperatures, no one is checking what's happening. There's many others. Fiat is really smart. Fiat used a timer on some of their vehicles. After 20 minutes, they switch off emission controls. Because European test is 20 minutes. And this has been happening for years and years and years. Of course, I exaggerate, but it is a scandal. It's a public health scandal because no one, no one has been checking how cars are performing on the road in our testing system today. And of course, the most sophisticated actually cheating was done by Volkswagen because they really designed their vehicle in such a way that it knows when a car is in a test because of various conditions, and it knows when it's on the road. This is actually quite smart German engineering. The rest of them are even simpler than that. So the result of all of this, uh, in, uh, well, uh, we would say it's transport and environment cheating, because it's certainly not. When European uh, regulations were put in place to reduce air pollution, they were not put in place to reduce air pollution in laboratories. It was definitely meant to be on the road. But the legal loophole was found, um, and that's the result. This is the millions and millions of dirty diesel cars and vans that are today on Europe's roads. It's around 80% of all new cars and vans that, that, that are sold. You can actually see that Belgium, comparatively to its um, population size, has a really large number of really highly polluting diesel vehicles, mostly due to the tax incentives and the company taxation. And, and things like that, where if you take a job, they don't go, I, I know that, I have lots of friends, you, you, can't, you can't get a pay rise, you have to get a diesel car. And, and this is the, the problem as, as well. Um, but another, I, I'll, I'll go through this quickly because I wanted to talk about the problems with our testing system. This is another problem. Actually, light duty diesel cars and vans is, is a really, not vans, sorry, diesel cars is a really European issue. When you go to anywhere else, this is not, not everyone in the world is perfect, but if you go to any other places, you would never see, apart from India maybe, but it's changing, you would never see so many small diesel city cars. We are a diesel island in Europe when it comes to cars, and it also has huge implications, not only for air pollution, but the competitiveness of our car industry. Because the future will be zero emission eventually, and we're not producing zero emission cars, it will be electric, and eventually we will be importing cars from China, and we will be also losing our jobs to China, because today, in the short term way, we are protecting diesel. But there's also another really big structural problem. This is a, a caricature of, of European leaders defending diesel. There's also a very big structural problem why, for so many years in Europe, we closed the eye to the diesel air pollution problem. Because we knew about it. Now, suddenly, there's so many reports from the 80s and 90s that were ignored. There was a big scandal in France. There was a report that was ignored. The reality is lies in the problem in our type approval or homologation system. In the United States, there's one authority, and it has the powers to, to, do, to protect and to, to check the cars. In Europe, we have 28. 
but because we have the single market, you can only go to one. So what happens in practice is Volkswagen would choose to go to Germany, approve their vehicle, and put it all across Europe. And no one else can do anything against that manufacturer apart from Germany, because they gave the approval, or type approval as it's called. And actually today, with all these diesel, dirty diesel cars in Germany, I very often get calls from people here in Brussels and they ask me, but what can we do? What can we ask to the Belgian government? Not much, actually. There is not much that either Brussels or the Belgian government can do to stop a lot of dirty French and, and German, for example, Italian diesel cars. They will have to go and ask Miss Merkel to do something. And this is a big problem, that everyone defends their national car manufacturer. Everyone knows that if they ask all of them to repair their cars, it would go, the industry would go bust. They would be bankrupt. And it is a big problem. So what we would like to see is first and foremost a more independent, a more European in-service or market surveying system. The cars can be approved still in the member states, but there has to be a second level of control, an independent European centre that would test cars on the road, check their emissions, and if they do not comply, I'd ask them to be recalled, repaired, take away their approval, what, what might it be. But this is the only way to insert some kind of independence into the system. Because today this is simply simply not happening. We now have so much evidence, what I showed you before, on millions of dirty diesels. Nothing has happened in, in Germany. The Volkswagen case, even the main Volkswagen case, is going on for two years without resolution. Because there's no political will to get, uh, to, to get manufacturers to, 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 to actually clean up. Um, so this is a summary of, sorry, they're quite technical, very detailed European uh, things that can be done today to, to, to actually improve the situation. Just please don't get me wrong. I don't want to tell you that tomorrow if you want to buy a car, you should buy petrol. It's quite often been misquoted. Don't buy petrol. There's other problems with petrol. But if you really, really, really want to buy a car, um, I mean, just don't. In Brussels, driving is horrible, right? But go for hybrid, go for plug-in hybrid, go for electric, or really just don't go for anything. Take public transport, obviously, especially in the city. So don't, don't. I always get, you know, misquoted that I support petrol. Absolutely not. But there are many things we can do in Europe. I, I, I mentioned the reform, so that's the type of rural reform. We need to clean up dirty diesels now on the road. They're already there. ZEF mandate is a really effective policy. It stands for zero emission vehicle mandate, and it's how Tesla actually was created. It's an obligation on manufacturer to sell a certain amount of their vehicles as zero emission, so electric and fuel cell. Now China has it. China will have 7 million electric vehicles in 2025. In Europe, we are thinking about maybe a few million in 2030. It's, it's really a disgrace. And then, of course, new Euro norms, uh, better tests, and generally, overall, I think it's called control technique, but control technique is also a joke, generally, in Europe, and it needs improving, and there's many more techniques now to do much more effective on-road controls when vehicle is already in, in use. So, thank you very much, and I look forward to, to the discussion later.